fucking lie. All right, everyone. Welcome back to stage two of the All In Agency Summit. Uh, thank you so much for being here with me. Or I'm your host, Chris uh, Story, the handsomer Chris. Um, and with me is Ryan Watson. He's a partner at Upsourced, which is an outsourced financial strategy, uh, M&A advisory, and uh, and general finance or a general uh, accounting and everything finance agency. Totally. Uh, yes. for agency owners. So um, he also, I did want to mention that Upsource's, Upsource's hierarchy of financial needs is a, is a must see. So I will uh, drop the, the link to that, that in link the in the chat. And, uh, and we'll talk about it here in a second too. So uh, there you yeah. go. Yeah. So go. I'm just going to stop then because you're ahead of me and uh, <laughs> I'll let you take it over. Thanks so much. For right. being here. Sounds good, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. All right, cool. Um, well, anyway, thanks a lot, Chris. I really appreciate it. It's very excited to be here. Again, I, obviously, my name is Ryan, uh, and I'm one of the partners at Upsourced. And as Chris said, we are uh, a CFO advisory for a CFO advisory firm for uh, digital and creative agencies. Um, before I get into the presentation, maybe it's helpful to just give some context to like me and who I am and why I'm here through a story. Uh, because before I was this, you know, before I lived this, this illustrious life as a uh, accounting firm partner, um, I ran an agency, like I assume a number of you watching here have done. Um, my agency was actually an influencer marketing and media agency. And this has been a while, like this is before influencer was like, you know, the buzzy mainstream marketing tactic that it is today, right? It was early on. And, and I didn't, found the agency. I was, it was pretty early on. Um, and anybody who's had the distinct pleasure of working at an agency in the very early days knows that, um, it was not always sunshine and rainbows. Um, it was kind of goofy for us, especially because, you know, again, as I said, influencer was like this new thing. And so like our market was the wild west, like our, uh, competitors really didn't have a good sense for like what they were selling. Our customers definitely didn't know what they were buying. And we, as an agency, like we didn't really know what our unique place in the world was either, right? Like we were just trying to figure it out. In fact, I mean, to give you an example, um, like influencer of the time, this is still kind of true. Like the, the most influencer agencies at the time, they were selling like beauty care through celebrities on Instagram, right? Like that's what you think about. We were selling adult diapers on Pinterest. So, you know, you can imagine like we were still very uh, trying to figure it out, but um, we did have a lot of conviction for what we were doing. We had some early customers that had strong results and we believed a lot in what we thought was possible in our space with influencer. And so, um, we kept pushing and that propelled us through, you know, some real, some real ups and downs. I mean, I, I uh, and this is just, I, I'm sure a lot of agencies, especially in the last two years have experienced this too. We went through several rounds of layoffs, I think three in total and, by the end of our third layoff, like we were a small team of OGs, right? People who had been there forever, um, who kind of like knew how to work with one another. We were, we had like a second nature to kind of how we collaborated. Um, and, but we stuck together and we kept pushing. And eventually, uh, what we did started to click, not all at once, certainly, um, but slowly, like it started to come together. Um, and we started to win some campaigns with some big brands and, um, we had a pretty good margin. So we started to make a little bit of money and started to hire some people and then it kept working. Right. And now started to pick up a little bit more and we get follow on campaigns from some of these same very large, like household name brands. And these follow on campaigns are three, four, five times larger than the original campaigns and our margin's still good. So now we're really making money. And now it's like, okay, we're starting to roll. Okay. We're feeling really good. In fact, it's funny. I can still, <clears throat> I can still remember the leadership meeting where, um, one of my partners, I think actually said out loud, and I'm not kidding, said out loud, like, guys, I think, I think we cracked the code on this thing. Like, I think we figured out the agency, like if, if we, we, we solved the business. Right. And, and, you know, silly as it sounds like I, we really kind of operated as if like, this was just now this thing is just a runaway train. It's just going to keep going up into the right forever. We're just going to keep adding zeros. Like, 
you know, whatever. And we operated that way. We are celebrating. We're taking boondoggles. We're, you know, doing leadership retreats down to Soho House in South Beach. And we're, you know, then Key West and, you know, the whole thing, right? We're having fun. Um, until, and I think you probably know where this story is going, like until we hit a brick wall, like 90 miles an hour to a dead stop. And, um, you know, in retrospect, I suspect we probably should have seen or did see some cracks forming, but um, I distinctly remember when the very first, very first shoot a drop, the undeniable thing that, that made us take notice. And that was, um, we had this uh, rock star senior account manager had been with us from forever, um, you know, just kind of like uh, a very wonderful at her job, but also just kind of like cultural fabric of what we did, right? Like one of those people that works at your agency that's like that, you know, when you think of your agency, you think of that person, they're like your mascot, right? Well, this person just ups and leaves, like no discussion, no warning, minimal notice, just like, I don't want to be here anymore. And I can tell you like that absolutely rocked us. Like we just didn't see it coming, had no idea what happened. Like, you know, what's going on? Um, and then, uh, but I can tell you, we didn't have like a lot of time to really process like why did she leave and what's going on and what do we need to do here? Because literally the very next week we had this colossal F up, um, at one of our top clients and we ended up having to refund like a non-trivial amount of money back to them. And at this point we are all looking at ourselves like, what is going on? Like the walls are caving in. Where did this amazing agency that we were running go? Um, and I don't exactly remember how much long, how much longer after this, but not that long after this, we had like a third event where, and this is kind of when it was finally like, okay, we got to deal with this because we had this, you know, group of employees who uh, kind of came together and they brought forth some concerns they had about how the agency was being run, how they were being represented in leadership, what their sort of career progression looked like and their training looked like. And, you know, they were, they wanted some change. Um, and, um, you know, again, at this, now that this third kind of thing hits you in the face, like I can tell you that at least personally, this was a very dark period. Like this was a, I mean, again, like two months ago, I'm mentally like buying houses and cars in my head. And I'm just thinking like, holy cow, this is just the most fun thing to do in the whole world. And this thing's going to be successful forever. And all of a sudden I'm like, this might fall apart. Like there's go to zero risk in this business that I didn't clock. And, um, that was awful and it was lonely and it was scary and it was anyway, interesting. Um, now for our agency, we did eventually figure it out and ultimately found some success. And we did so by employing a couple of things I'm going to talk about like in a half hour. Okay. But that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is the realization that I had in that moment that realization that like, hey, you know what that thing my partner said in the meeting where, hey, we cracked the code, we solved it. That was wrong. <laughs> That's actually not how agencies are built. That's not how this game is played. Because the thing I realized was it's not a problem to be solved. An agency or running an agency is a journey. And along that journey, you're going to encounter problems. And those problems are going to require solutions, an operating model, right? And that operating model you're going to employ and it's going to work. And then you're going to keep going on your journey and you're going to face a new set of problems. And guess what? That operating model, obsolete, right? And if you try to use it, it's going to fall apart in your face. You're going to have the experience that I did because that new set of problems requires a new set of solutions, a new operating model, okay? And that realization that I took in this experience, I brought with me to Upsource in my current role as a CFO for 120 marketing agencies. And I watched that movie play out again and again and again until eventually we were like, okay, enough's enough. We've got to put some language to this, right? We keep seeing the same set of problems and solutions. We're going to build the framework, the definitive framework where we define, hey, these are the things we keep seeing. These are the inflection points. These are the problems that agencies are experiencing in those inflection points. And most importantly, these are the solutions. These are the frameworks that we've personally had success with, that our clients have personally had success with to overcome these problems. And that framework, of course, is the life cycle of agencies. That's the thing that I want to talk to you today. So my hope is as I go through this right over the next, whatever it is, 35 minutes, I'm going to talk about each of these stages. And as I'm talking about these stages, obviously I can't see anybody, but you should think to yourself, like, which stage are you in? And are these problems, these resonate with you? Are you experiencing these too? And 
my hope is that you'll have one or two things that you can take away from this presentation with you back to your agency to overcome whatever the problems are that you're facing at your current stage of the life cycle. So with that, let's get into it. So here's the life cycle, right? We got four stages. I'll go through each stage, but quickly we have create mode, which is zero to 1 million in revenue. We have build mode, which is 1 million in revenue to like two to 3 million in revenue or like three to 4 million in revenue rather. We have grow mode, which is like three to 4 million in revenue up to let's say eight to 10 million in revenue. And then we have scale mode, which is eight to 10 million in revenue and beyond. Okay. So let's talk about create mode. That's the first one, right? Create mode is zero to one, right? Zero to one literally and zero to one figuratively. Literally in that it is literally zero dollars in revenue to one million in revenue and figuratively in that you are building something from nothing. Like you're building the plane as you're flying it, right? And in this stage, and I'm not gonna spend like an enormous amount of time on this stage because I suspect a lot of folks in the audience have, um, have overcome at least the early half of create mode. But like ultimately... Um, this stage is all about sales and service, right? Like how do I, what, what is my unique reason to exist in the world and how do I find people to pay me for that unique existence from a financial perspective? I'll often say like, there's almost nothing that you can do in create mode, financially speaking, that I can't undo or help you help fix for you in build mode, right? Once you get to a million in revenue, the one thing I cannot fix for you is getting you to build mode. That is your whole job. And so, and I'll point out a couple of watch outs for each of these stages, but the watch out in create mode is doing something that we often call playing business. Playing business is this term we use here at Upsource to describe like doing things that feel productive, right? Like doing things, it's like, oh yeah, I put a whole, you know, eight hour day into this, I, you know, job well done, but they didn't actually move the ball forward. It actually did not contribute to your primary or secondary goal. So for instance, like, doing an elaborate business plan or building like a five-year projection or forecast. That shit is not useful in create mode, right? Because your whole job is just to get to build mode and all the stuff that you're going to create in your business plan and your five-year forecast is going to be garbage anyway, right? So watch out for the, the catch of playing business. Now, while you are now starting to like round third and start to eye build mode, start to eye that seven figure in revenue, you do have permission to start thinking about some financial topics. And predominantly, you're going to start to think about what we call unit economics. Or in other words, like the things I'm doing, the projects that I sell, are they making money? Because once we get to build mode, we absolutely are now going to go to work. Like we are going to focus on getting you profitable and repeatable and sustainable. And so what we want to do is make sure that on our way to build mode, we are setting ourselves up for some degree of success, okay? We're selling projects in a way that's gonna enable us to actually make some money. So we wanna make sure we understand our unit economics, which from a project perspective are a function of my pricing and my rate, right? So the first thing is like, when you sell a project, especially if like it's a fixed bid project, let's say you're doing like a $100,000 website project, the first thing you need to start to do is ask yourself, hey, when I put $100,000 on that project, what was I thinking I would make? Like. Obviously, I know I'm going to earn $100,000 in revenue. <clears throat> what did I think it was going to cost me? In other words, hours it was going to take times the average cost rate it was going to, I was going to incur. What was my expected project margin on that? And then at the other side of that project, did I earn that, right? Like, let's actually do the math. Let's, let's look at the hours. Where did I end up? So creating that machinery and building that habit to start looking at that, very important as you're starting to like exit create mode, I build mode. While you're doing that um, and you're optimizing for your unit economics, you're going to optimize for your rate, which, you know, just as an easy heuristic, we often recommend sort of targeting like a three to one. So your 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 target bill rate is going to be roughly three times your average cost rate. Um, that gives you some wiggle room to earn a, a good gross margin. And you're going to start to optimize for your cost rate, right? Reduce the average cost it takes you to um, service these projects. Now, in create mode, as you're reducing or optimizing your average cost rate, one of the things you're likely to do is start to transition from what was predominantly a freelance driven organization to what is likely to bias a little bit more toward a full time team, right? Because if you think about how agencies are generally built in the beginning, right? Let's say I sell my first $100,000 project and that project requires 
somebody who has strategy, copy, development, design, whatever else, right? These disciplines. Well, obviously, I don't have the I don't have enough money from that one project to be able to afford a full time expert in each of those disciplines. And even if I could, like, I don't have enough work for them, right? It doesn't make any sense. And so, what do I do? I hire freelancers, right? Because while freelancers have some pros and cons, the primary pro of a freelancer is the flexibility, right? I pay for what I need, okay? And so in the early days, that flexibility is the most important thing for me. It's the most important thing. But as I grow and I get more work, that flexibility becomes a little bit less important. I now have enough work possibly for a full-time person. And now the cons, the negatives of a freelancer start to rear their head. And the biggest, of course, is the cost. Average cost rate of a freelancer is just more than a full-time person. You also have like, you know, the, the sort of like training and institutional knowledge that you're building with a person that accrues some value when it's a full-time person and maybe not as much when it's a freelance person. So so now you 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 we get at this stage agency owners who are always asking us the question, which is like, okay, I'm getting to this point. Like, when should I start hiring these people as full-time? Or when should I start replacing freelancers with full-time folks? And, and these agency owners often <clears throat> extrapolate this problem in their head, like Charlie Day trying to solve a, you know, like it's, it's, it's this, it's built up as this really complicated problem. And in, in reality, it's a very simple math problem. It's a very simple math problem. And so let's just talk about the very simple math. At the core, um, we're just trying to figure out like at what point does it cost as much money uh, or less to hire a full-time person than a freelancer, right? Like at what point, what's the break-even point, okay? And so that's the first question I have to ask. At what point is the is the cost the same? And so in order to answer that question, obviously I know, I got to get an apples to apples comparison. Obviously I know how much a freelancer costs per hour because like it's what they tell you. There's no hidden costs. It's whatever it is, 150 bucks an hour. That's the cost. Full-time person, a little bit less straightforward. And so the, the the point here is just to make sure that you determine the fully loaded cost of your full-time person, your full-time resource you're considering hiring. Um, and that includes their salary, of course, as well as their payroll tax, as well as their benefits, as well as any other uh, or health insurance, as well as any other benefits like 401k. And so you're going to add all that stuff up. You're going to divide by 2080 and you're going to get uh, a fully loaded hourly rate you can use to compare to your freelancer to determine like, what's my break even point, right? And then the next um, the next thing you're gonna do is just say like, okay, well, how much work do I need for this full-time person for them for them to cost the same, right? So my, my full-time person at hundred bucks an hour, they're 4,000 bucks a week. So how much work do I need for the freelancer to cost 4,000 bucks a week? I have to figure out like, okay, well then the next question is that freelancer, what is their rate or what is the cost premium? How much more? Does the freelancer cost than the full-time person? And so if their cost premium is, let's say, two times, so they're twice as expensive, then I need 20 hours, right? I need half, half of a, of a full-time person, right? So my break-even point is 50%. Now, if that cost premium is lower, they're not as expensive relative to a full-time person, same math, but the dot changes, right? My break-even point's a little bit larger. In this case, if it's a 1.5x uh, cost premium, well, then it's just like 28 hours, right? Anyway. You got to figure out like, what is their relative cost? What's the break-even point amount of work? Okay. And then we got to ask, okay, relative to the break-even point, when, when do I hire that person? And so that, that ends up looking like a range that starts a little bit before the break-even point. So I might actually pay a little bit more to have a full-time person and continues a little bit after the break-even point. And where you fall in that range ends up being a very subjective uh, decision based on Things like um, how critical is this role to what we do? Like if this is a very mission critical role to what our agency exists for and it's a big part of how we get renewals, then you're going to hire them sooner. And if it's non-core and it's not a thing that you're going to lean into, you're going to wait a little bit longer. Do I have an, a freelancer that's already identified and working and and uh, you know it's not broken yet? Okay, great. I'm going to wait a, bit, a little bit longer. But if I don't have a freelancer or I have one that just quit or it's, it's cost me some renewals or business, I'm going to hire a little bit earlier. So anyway, it's very easy. Choose the break-even point, draw your lines, decide which end of the spectrum you're going to hire. And again, like I said, if the cost premium is a little different, <clears throat> it's the same math. You're just going to move up and down this little spectrum. So that's your framework for optimizing the, co the cost rate. And as you do that and work on your unit economics, you will eventually, in all likelihood, reach build mode. Build mode 
excuse me while I get some water. I'll probably do that a couple more times. Um, build mode is our second phase of the agency life cycle. Build mode is the point where you celebrate like, hooray, we made it. The team gets together in a conference room, four-way high five. We've done it, right? We did the thing that we expected. We got to a million dollars. We've proven we have a reason to exist. Um, we've we've really mitigated, you know, our go to zero risk to some degree. And so we're feeling pretty good, kind of, right? We got here, but in all likelihood, we probably got here on shoestring and bubblegum. And we probably got here, um, you know, feeling like we own a, biz a job more than we own a business. And we're working 80 hours a week and we've got 17 hats and our agency doesn't make a ton of money. And I'll tell you, that is a feature, not a bug of your experience at this inflection point. Because remember, in create mode, none of that, that, none of that was the focus. So it's okay. The focus was getting here and now you're here. Now, now we have to go to work, right? And again, the way that we go to work is we work on getting you profitable, sustainable, and repeatable. And so how do we do that? Where do we start? right? What's the most important thing at this stage, right? What's the one KPI you should focus on? Well, we have a framework for that, right? We have a framework that helps us answer this. And by the way, Chris, he's dropped a, a link to this framework in the, the comments, kind of gave a little segue at the beginning. It's called the hierarchy of financial needs, right? This is our tool that we use for build mode to figure out, okay, now that I have all of these problems, which one do I focus on first? And we've organized it, not coincidentally, similar to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, in the same way that I cannot worry about self-actualization if I don't have shelter, in my agency, I can't worry about my predictable revenue growth engine if I can't make payroll next week, right? And so what we've done is we've taken the most important KPIs for an agency and we've organized them in a sequential hierarchy. And what we do, and we do this for every one of our new clients, we go through what we call a hierarchy of financial needs assessment. What we're going to do is we're going to look at your agency through the lens of every one of these KPIs. And when we get to a step along uh, this little staircase where we have a, a failure or an opportunity, let's say, we stop. That's what we focus on. That is what we go to work on. And then once we clear that stage, we move to the next one. So I'm going to go through all the stages and I'm also going to give you some somewhat practical tips here. I'm not, not somewhat, very practical tips. I'm going to give you very practical tips on how to clear each stage if that's where you are. So again, think to yourself, okay, which one of these is me? And then hopefully I can, uh, I can help you clear it. So first and foremost is solvency. So again, can I make payroll next week? Yes or no? If the answer is no, we're in the ER. It's triage mode. Patients on the table. We got to get cash in the door as soon as possible. And so we got to get cash and there's only a couple places to get it. Obviously, one of which is just customers. Like, is there cash sitting with our customers that we can access? Obviously, the first one is like, are there past due invoices that we can go access? The thing I will tell you in this, in, in with regard to past due, is don't think about those in such binary terms. In other words, they owe me fifty thousand dollars. I need them to pay or not pay. There's probably a pretty good reason that that client who owes you fifty thousand dollars hasn't paid you the fifty thousand, and it's probably related to the fact that they can't pay you the fifty thousand. But they might be able to pay you five. They might be able to pay you five. And that five would go a long way to helping your payroll problem and would go a long way to making them feel like they're making some progress, right? So consider looking at creative opportunities to, uh, to dislodge the bottleneck with some of these past due invoices. For invoices that are not past due, don't think about those so binary either because just because it's not at its due date doesn't mean it's not a collection opportunity. You may and likely do have clients who absolutely have capacity and willingness to pay you. They just haven't because they don't have to, right? But if you gave them a reason to, like a financial incentive, they'd be more than willing. And I tell you from experience running my agency, that financial incentive does not have to be significant. It could just be 1% of the invoice for a, a, a 10 day early payment. And again, that 1% you would happily part ways with to keep your staff paid uh, and happy, right? Now, the other thing I want to add with regard to um, invoices is if you happen to have a past due invoice for a project that's currently in flight, like you're doing work on these folks, that's a pencils down situation, okay? We are not going to do any more 
We are going to stop because that work is our only leverage. That's the only leverage we have to collect our money. And once we're done with the work, now we're just relying them, relying on them to be good business citizens. But when we do have the work in hand, we can leverage that. So make sure you don't give it away. Okay. So customers is one place we get money. The other place, obviously, if you're personally wealthy and you want to put money into the business, you should do that. Um, and if you don't, then we often see agencies look to debt, right? Debt is a very common solution in a solvency crisis. Let me just be clear on upsource position on the use of debt in these situations. If the reason you're in a solvency crisis, can't make payroll on Friday, is because of timing, like, hey, I've got this large customer who's got this giant invoice that's due next week. I tried, but I couldn't compel them to pay earlier, but they're very credit worthy. They've paid us before. I'm very confident. Line of credit is perfect for that situation. It's a bridge to a timing situation. But if the reason you're in this solvency crisis is because you don't have enough business for the cost structure, the people of your team, and you do not have contractual line of sight, like a signed contract, to a solution to that problem, don't use debt. Don't use debt. You, the problem hasn't solved itself. All you're doing is hopping on the express highway to personal bankruptcy. And I'm just going to tell you, I've seen that movie way too many times to get a good night's sleep anymore. I don't want that for you. So don't use debt in that situation, only for timing. All right, cool. So once you've cleared solvency, now we move to gross margin. <clears throat> Gross margin is kind of the whole ball game. Like this is running an agency. And by the way, you may solve this gross margin problem once and it's going to come back and again and again. Because the thing about agencies is often what we're doing is we're trying to match the supply of our people, supply and demand, right? We have demand, which is like in the form of customers want to buy things from us. They want our services. And in project-based agencies, the demand is kind of like a sign graph, right? It goes up and down. But we have, and we have to match that with the supply of people we have ready to do that work. And in an, a larger agency where most of our team is full-time, that looks flat, right? And so you can see plenty of opportunities when demand is going like this and supply is going like this, where you've got outages. I don't have enough people. I have too many people. I don't have enough people. I have too many people. And gross margin is the way that that manifests. And it's the thing that we manage to try to solve some of our sort of capacity problems. So gross margin, and, and just to be clear, the metric, if you're not familiar, is revenue minus cost of goods sold. In other words, the cost it takes me to earn my revenue in agencies, it's almost always just the people, the service salaries to do the work um, expressed as a fraction, basically, or a percentage. Um, and so when we're working on gross margin, we we, tell, we call this the margin triangle. We're not going to actually like manage gross margin as a single um, metric, right? We're going to manage... The two levers, and there are two inputs and only two inputs or levers to gross margin. <clears throat> and those inputs are utilization. In other words, I've got this service team. I'm paying them a full-time wage. How much of their time is actually spent on things that are gener generating revenue for me? And how much is excess capacity? That's utilization. And then project profit. Okay, so when my people are doing work, am I earning enough relative to their cost rate for me to earn a good gross margin. And these two things are joined at the hip by math to form gross margin, right? So like if I know my project profit and I know my utilization, I know my gross margin, right? It is just math. And in the case where my project profit is 65%, which by the way, is normally what we have agencies target. And my utilization for my service team is 70%, which by the way, is normally what we have agencies target. Then I know my gross margin is 50%, which by the way, is kind of where we think a lot of agencies can live. The target for gross margin is somewhere between maybe 40 on the low end, depending on your kind of agency, to 50 or low 50s on the high end. So a healthy agency is likely to fall in that range. And by the way, if my project profit falls to 60%, for instance, and utilization stays flat at 70%, well, I know my gross margin is going to fall is 43%, right? It's just math. I could spend the whole 45 minutes just on gross margin alone and how I influence and manage to gross margin. And obviously, I don't have that amount of time. The one thing I will say is... A lot of agencies look to try to solve either their project profit or their utilization problem from the top down. Like, okay, I have a, my project margins are low. It's, I'm, I'm earning 50%. What could be the, the, what could be the cause? Oh, I bet it's, uh, I bet it's pricing or I bet it's scoping or I bet it's whatever. Uh, and they try to, they try to um, assign these like blanket solutions to the problem. 
The reality is that's not normally how it works. And that's almost never how you can identify this, the root cause. The only way to identify the root cause of a project profit or a utilization problem is brick by brick. In other words, looking at individual projects and asking myself, okay, that one went off the rails. What was the project margin? Okay, why? Okay, great. I'm going to solve that problem. I'm going to move to the next brick. I'm going to ask the same question. Why? And then, oh, I've done this a few times. Oh, a couple of them are the same reason. Oh, I have a, they're both because we scoped it wrong. Okay, now I have a theme and now I can attack that theme. But it has to be bottoms up. It's the only way to do it. Cool. Okay. So once I'm on the other side of my gross margin opportunity, now I'm starting to accumulate some cash. And now I need to start to accumulate a cash reserves, right? Because again, remember, often in a project-based business, demand and therefore cash flow is kind of going like this. And you need enough reserves in the tank to sustain you through these low periods, right? And so what we typically recommend is to target three months of fixed monthly operating expenses in your cash reserves. And that's a starting point. If you've got like a highly, you know, retainer based or recurring revenue based business, probably do a little less. Um, if you are really volatile, like all over the place, you probably need, you know, just sleep better at night if you had more. Three months is like a decent starting place. Now, how do you get cash reserves, right? Well, obviously the simplest way is to have good gross margins over a period of time. Um, but there are some things you can do to expedite the collection of cash. And I would say uh, one of the ways is getting your clients on auto pay or ACH. Now, obviously, this is a thing that a lot of retainer-based agencies think of. If if you are one and you haven't thought about it, like there's just no good reason why your clients are not on auto pay. Uh, but even clients that are not on auto pay that have variable like project-based uh, invoices, we have a number of our own clients who have ACH authorizations and they can just pull that money the day they cut the invoice now look is every client gonna be okay with that no but will some of them be okay yes from experience they will and if you can get 30 40 50 percent of your clients to pay that way that's gonna really shorten your collection cycle and that is gonna make it very easy to get a bunch of cash reserves on hand so consider that as a bunch of really good tools out there like ignition and invoiced that can enable some of this stuff and then also line of credit again remember we talked about that this is great for timing bad for you know, not making money, but we recommend every one of our clients get a line of credit, particularly when times are good, banks are willing to lend. So make sure if that's you, you should. Okay. Now we get to net profit. Now remember gross margin had kind of a range of targets, you know, 40 to 50%, depending on the type of agency net profit, not quite as variable. Um, once you get to a certain size, like North of two and a half million, uh, 20% net margin is very achievable. There's no good reason that you don't have a 20% net margin. And again, that's just how much profit am I making after I pay for everything, right? Not just cost of goods sold, but operating expenses, overhead, administrative salaries, all that kind of stuff. 20% is very achievable. We've got plenty of clients deep into the thirties. So that's achievable. Now, just to be clear, we work with like 120 agencies and our median is not 20%. It's like 12%. So if you are not at 20% and you are, you know, north of 2 million or more in revenue, what I would say to you is it is possible. You can get there, but you're in good company that you're not, right? You shouldn't feel bad about yourself, but you got an opportunity here. Great. So how do I, so now that I know, hey, Ryan, I'm, I'm at eight and I want to get 20. How do I do it? Okay. So the biggest drivers of net profit, obviously gross margin is the number one, right? Like if you have a good gross margin, all this other stuff, super easy. If you have a bad gross margin, none of this other stuff really matters that much. So gross margin is the whole ball game. But once you have a good gross margin, then it becomes discipline, right? Like the operating expense budgeting exercise is simply a matter of setting reasonable, for, uh, reasonable benchmarks against how much I'm spending on sales and marketing and all my other overhead, sticking to it, and then letting operating leverage take over. And operating leverage is this beautiful thing that happens as your agency gets larger, right? Because if you're entering the build mode at a million dollars in revenue and you're paying yourself as an owner 150 grand in salary, well, that's going to take up a big percentage of your revenue, right? Like it's going to be hard for you to do 20%. But once you get to three and four million in revenue, I think you've probably given yourself a raise at this point. And by the way, you should, but are you making 600 grand? No, you're probably not, right? Like, and that's what operating leverage is, right? As you, as revenue grows, your overhead grows, but not at the same rate, never grows at the same rate. And so as overhead grows at a smaller rate than revenue, as a percentage of revenue, your overhead goes down, which means your profit goes up for free just by growing. 
that's operating leverage. And so again, once you're north of two, two and a half million in revenue, you can actually start to take advantage of operating leverage and you can get in the 20s and 30s uh, percent in net profit. Okay, cool. Last capstone to the hierarchy of financial needs is predictable revenue growth. Um, and again, this just means like moving away from like the organic word of mouth, whatever incidental way of getting business to like, you know, I have, I have repeatable inputs that have predictable outputs. <laughs> Biggest unlock here, retainable revenue. Now, let me be clear. Retainable revenue does not mean retainer. Obviously, recurring or purely recurring um, revenue businesses, holy grail, that's what we're all shooting for. But you don't have to have that. You can be a project-based business and still have retainable revenue. Or in other words, revenue in a given year that is coming from customers you've had in previous years by having a good account management function with customers that have opportunities for follow-on projects, either in the same brand or maybe even like a land and expand strategy. You're working with PNG, you work on Tide, then you work on Crest, that kind of stuff. And so, you know, I, what I can tell you is if you don't have retainable revenue, like you don't have the opportunity to have revenue coming from the same sources year after year, I've never seen an agency client of ours eclipse the three to four million in revenue and get to grow mode without it, right? The best agencies have it, minimum 50%, ideally 70 to 80%, okay? That's the unlock. So anyway, once you've cleared the hierarchy of financial needs, congratulations, you have found yourself in grow mode. And in grow mode, you are like I was, you know, on a party bus from South Beach to Key West, feeling like the world is, you know, is all going my way. And then, of course, right, you hit the wall and you're crying into your glass of champagne because it doesn't stay easy for long, right? Inevitably, what's going to happen is you are, unless you sort of like yeah, listen to my presentation, you had this one off of the past. If you don't, you're going to find yourself with situations where like, okay, all of a sudden, like clients are upset and they're churning and you're not delivering with excellence like you used to be. There's tensions that are rising within your employees and you might have some employee turnover and it just feels harder, right? Like things just, it went from like, oh my gosh, we're making money and it's feeling easy to like, it's hard again, right? And the question is like, okay, why did that happen? Well, it happened because you outgrew your operating model, right? Back when we were rocking in build mode, right? We had this small, nimble team. We were kind of like, it was OGs and we had this second nature way of working together and we kind of figured it out. Like we were all in the room together when we figured out how to deliver excellent service for client A. But guess what? You hired employees that weren't in the room and they don't know and it's not written down anymore. These employees are not OGs and they don't have that same second nature. And by the way, they are now like three and four layers removed from your centralized leadership team that was so effective in build mode. And now it's a bottleneck right? They can't get work done because you're in the way and they don't have as much access to you as they used to do. So how do we solve this problem, right? How do we, how do we go back to the way things were when they were working, right? Well, we have to professionalize the organization. Now, one of the ways we professionalize organization, of course, is process. Some of that stuff that we decided in the room, got to write it down, right? We got to enable our new, uh, our new employees to have a home, like the OGs felt they have a home. We got to do things like paid parental leave, right? We got to grow up, but it's not all process. It's not all writing things down, right? Because look, we are not making t-shirts on an assembly line. It's not that kind of work, right? We're creatives. The work we do is fluid. It's bespoke. It needs to, it, we, we need to be able to be, um, to, to customize and to be kind of fluid. And so we need to go back to a world where we were small, and we could operate that way, right? We need to make, we need to shrink the organization. We need to make it smaller. And now I don't mean like we need to go fire half our clients to just go back to 2 million in revenue. That's not what I mean. But what I do mean is we now, how do we make it smaller? Like if we don't shrink, how do we make it smaller? We divide the business into its component parts. We can't manage this thing as a monolith anymore. It doesn't work. So now we got to divide it into smaller parts that we can manage in a largely the same way that we were able to manage the business on its own in build mode. Okay, so we got to divide into component parts. Now, how do I determine the component parts? Well, look, there's a couple ways to do it. If you have departments, right, like you go to market with discrete business offerings, like I have an SEO division and I have a content division and I have a media division, like, well, that's probably a pretty natural way for you to divide your organization. If you don't go to market that way, then, you know, there's no sense in forcing it. If it's more of a homogenous offering, then you may have to choose something that looks more like portfolios, like divisions of clients. This is a pod one, pod two. This pod has these clients. This pod has those clients. doesn't really matter, right? Find a natural, a rational way to divide your organization. Once I found a rational way for me to divide my organization, 
I need deputies, right? Deputies are the next level of leadership that you need to promote or hire that is now going to run their little patch of grass in a manner that ladders up to your patch of grass, right? You're going to you're going to hold them accountable and you're going to incentivize them to manage goals that ladder up to your goals, okay? So we got to find deputies. Now once we find deputies, what do we got to do for them? Three things. And this is the framework for attacking grow mode. We set goals, we hold them accountable to those goals, and we align their incentives, compensation to those goals, okay? So let's go through these three things and talk about how do we do that. So the first thing, set goals. Okay, how do we set goals for deputies um, of their of these little departments? The first thing we got to know is what are our org goals, right? Like we said, we got these. They have to manage the business that ladders up to the way that we manage the business. So what's important to us, right? Obviously, gross margin and net margin and are are things that are important to us. And and um, you know net pro, you know net promoter score or client satisfaction, those are important to us. Is revenue retention important to us? Is upsells important to us? Like whatever it is, like we got to be very clear. If we're not clear about what matters up here, it's never, we're never going to get goals down here, right? So what are the goals uh, at the organization level? And then what levers are you willing to enable the deputies to pull in order to manage to those goals? Like a classic question would be, are they, are, are you going to enable them to sort of hire and fire autonomously? If the answer is yes, then you can hold them to like a comprehensive gross margin target. If the answer is no, and they can't manage capacity on their own, then you're not going to be able to do that. And you're going to have to only manage them to components of gross margin, right? So <clears throat> no right or wrong answer here, but just be clear about what levers are they enabled, are they able to influence? Because there's literally nothing more demotivating than being held accountable to a metric that you cannot influence. Okay. What levers can they influence? Great. So now that I have my goals, and by the way, agencies that try to do this often get the... I got to shrink the org right. I got to find uh, departments right. I got to get deputies and I got to give them goals. They often get those things right. And then usually that's where they stop, right? And then it's like, okay, well, see you next year. And then, you know, look, we all went back to our life and we just kind of forgot about this whole deputy thing, right? It was just words, it wasn't action. So <clears throat> one of the most important steps is you got to create a mechanism to continue to reinforce this thing you just decided, right? And we recommend MBRs. Convene the deputies, get them together in a room. Let's talk about what, like, let's talk about expectations versus reality. Like, here's your goals. How do we do? It's not a punitive meeting, by the way. This is a collaborative meeting. So, hey, it, we didn't, we didn't hit our goals. No problem. What are we going to do differently next month, Sally, in order to hit these goals? Sam, you got the same goals. What are we going to do differently to hit our goals? And what's a beautiful thing is going to happen is uh, we're going to leave and then we're going to come back, right? We're going to repeat that same exercise. And you know that Sally is going to be thinking about the fact that we're going to repeat that. And you can guarantee that Sally does not want to be in a conference room looking at a slide or on a Zoom looking at her name next to a missed goal, right? So while it's not punitive, it's very motivating. They are going to remember that this is going to happen and that will motivate behavior for them to try these things that we're going to do to try to influence our, our goals, right? So very important. And then the third and final align the incentives, right? Compensation. The holding them accountable is important, but obviously at the end of the day, um, what, you know, what they care about all is, is compensation. So we could talk a lot about how do we set the right comp, but what I will say is simple is better than complex, right? Sally might have four goals that are important for her and managing her department. She doesn't have to have four goals for her compensation. It needs to be easy. Mental math. When X happens, Y occurs in my compensation. And if I can't do that math, because like, well, 25% of my comp is based on hitting this metric. It's not all or nothing. I can get 70%, but this one, the other is 30%, but that's all or nothing. Like, forget about it. When something happens, it's like, I can't, I have no idea what that's going to do to my comp. So forget about it. I'll just figure it out at the end of the year. That doesn't work. Very simple. Choose one sort of overarching goal. Use that to drive the compensation. I like having a base with a bonus target based on your goal and the opportunity to earn a little bit more if you do better and a little bit less but not nothing if you don't fully meet the whole goal. And of course, just like the MBR, you got to report on progress often. Got to reinforce, hey, remember what uh, our bonus plan was? Well, let's check in and talk about how we're doing and what we're projecting you to end the year at, All right? And those deputies, those are the things that are going to power you to scale mode. Scale mode is our last stage. Scale mode is eight to 10. I'm not going to spend any time on scale mode because the thing about scale mode is there are no prescriptions. This is a choose your own adventure kind of a thing. Okay. You might choose to grow your business north of 10 million inorganically and 
and acquire a bunch of agencies. And the solution there is to hire a bunch of been there, done that's to help you do that. But you might pursue a different growth model. The point here is just to say it's there and not every agency is going to choose to pursue it. Right. So that is the hierarchy of financial needs real quickly. I'm sorry, the life cycle of agencies real quickly, just to recap the four stages. Remember again, picture where you are and, and these little takeaways will help kind of guide you for how do you get through it? The first one, of course, being create mode, create mode, sales and service. Don't play business. Just focus on getting to 1 million in revenue. Once you get there, now we go to work. We're going to get you profitable, sustainable, repeatable. And the way that we do that is we work our way from the bottom to the top of the hierarchy of financial needs. Once we've cleared the hierarchy of financial needs, hopefully we've missed that brick wall that we might hit. But if we haven't, uh, we need to shrink the organization. Uh, we need to divide into our component parts. We need to find deputies. We need to set goals, hold them accountable, and align their incentives. And if we have success and choose to continue, we find ourselves in scale mode, which is choose your own adventure. And that is the hierarchy or that is the life cycle of agencies. All right, Chris, that's all I got for you, man. I'm coming back. All that right. was, uh, you just delivered like a master class. I was expecting like financial, like tactical financial uh -huh. tips, but we just got an entire master class on how to scale an agency, uh, from finances to like, <laughs> to leadership whole, to, like just the whole shebang. I mean, the whole thing, man. Topic. Well, I've lived it. It's not easy, <laughs> but there's a few, few potholes you can avoid along the way. Hopefully I was able to help. Yeah. I'd love to open it up. We don't have a, a ton of time, but if there are any questions in the chat, uh, would love, love to, to get those answered. Um, I'll give you just a, a couple of seconds. One of the things Ryan that you mentioned, um, towards the end was incentive comp. Yeah. Is that something that you typically would reserve for that the, the grow mode stage or can not necessarily? You yeah, not necessarily. I mean, I would say a lot of our build mode agencies have um again, I wouldn't and, and some of this is gonna come to manner of um preferences. I would not create individualized incentive comp plans in build mode with sure. the exception of if you do have a standalone business development person and you want to put them on a commission model, that's a separate story. But I do like having like, Hey, look, as a company, we have a company wide bonus. That company wide bonus is like when we win together, you know, when we win, we win together. And so here's a, whatever it is, NPS revenue, whatever. Here's one number that we're all working towards. I like that idea for sure. Same idea. Keep it simple, have the opportunity to exceed and, and fall a little bit short, but still participate. But I don't like creating a lot of complicated individualized incentive plans until you have deputies and you don't need deputies until you have to shrink the org. Like you don't want to do that. Like that whole creating departments and assigning deputies, you do that because you have to do that. Right. You would prefer not to. It, you're making it a little bit more complicated, but you it's 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 the only way. But in the in build mode, you don't have any of that stuff. So sure. I, I would just say simple company wide incentive plans. I like. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I, I don't see any questions coming through the chat, but I do see a lot of uh, great feedback. So thank you. Love that. For, Appreciate yeah. that. Sarah Christy, Tony, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, you guys that were here, share the recording. Uh, tell people to come back and watch this. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and close it out at 3 Eastern. Uh, we will have on this stage, Max Trailer, uh, the consultant's consultant. And then on stage one, we will have Logan Lyles on getting more leads. Um, so hope to see you back here for stage two. Again, Ryan, thank you so much. And we'll see My you back here in just a few minutes. For sure.